Nation, welcome back. You are tuned into another episode of Patrick Young and the Rowdies. I'm your host, Patrick Young, former Gator, 2010-14, to 14, currently stationed across the Atlantic Ocean in Athens, Greece, here to give you all things Florida basketball and more. As I say on every show, first, I want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart for being here with me, the people of the field of 60. 68 Media Networks, thank you so much. If you could please do us a favor as we walk this journey together, baby, all the way across the world by hitting the subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, whatever platform, please share, rate, review, anything. Let us know how we're doing. It is all greatly appreciated. Without further ado, I am so thoroughly excited for my next guest. Honestly, I think the last time I, well, we're sitting down, not in the same room, but the last time we sat down uh, together would have been when he recruited me, well, helped close the deal on my recruitment to come to Florida, but none other than Jeremy Foley, who, whom arrived at the University of Florida in 1976 as an intern at the ticket office, 14 years later, special year, in 1992, whoop, whoop. He is named the AD of the University of Florida. 2016, he felt as though his time as the man in charge had come to a close and his vision for the program had been achieved. After 27 national titles, being the only Division I AD to win multiple titles in football and basketball, 130 SEC titles, top 10 nationally in all sports ranking every year under him, uh, and 17 of those 24 years finishing in the top five all sports ranking. That's all sports. My man, I'm so thankful to have you on. I'm so thankful. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Patrick. So good to see you, man. You're always, so one, great. Of my, you're always one of my favorites. So I, I appreciate you. that. I, I, I had to do a little bit of research. And uh, there's a quote I wanted to read to you that uh, hopefully, hopefully this will ring uh, familiar to you. I never knew anybody who was unhappy with their job and was happy with their life. It's your sense of purpose. Now, some people can find it elsewhere. Some people can work a job and find it someplace else. Who are those lyrics from? You tell me. Bruce Springsteen. I was gonna say, I thought, <laughs> I thought that was the boss. <laughs> what, was, what was the song? <laughs> oh, I don't even know the song. I just was looking at the lyrics to try and find something to kind of accurately depict uh, someone that, is, that did that, that found it, it wasn't work for you. It was, it was purpose. It was every day to, to, you know, for me, look from the outside. And that's why I'm so thankful to have you on. It's awesome to get the chance to sit down here and pick your brain and, and just hear from you, your perspective on, uh, you know, the time when you were, you're, I'll say your whole 40 plus years, because you're still doing a lot now with the university. So your 40 plus years of being a Gator. Yeah, well, you're exactly right, Patrick. I was blessed to um, have a job that um, obviously there were good days and bad days, but there wasn't one time in my 40-plus um, years when my alarm clock went off, I said, geez, I have to go to work at the University of Florida. You know, I, I, like I said, I might have had a tough day ahead like we all do, but um, I loved it. I loved being a Gator. I loved working with the people I worked with. I loved being around people like yourself. Obviously, some of the coaches that um, that we brought aboard, I mean, a guy who loves sports, I had a, I had a, I had a career of a, you know, a lifetime. I yeah, mean, you know, I, was, I was blessed. Yeah, I was blessed. and I was, I was uh, reading up on you a little bit before this, and actually, you said, uh, you, we share this. I'm a, I'm a red, big diehard Red Sox fan. Let's, let's not tell uh, Coach Donovan um, <laughs> that, but you, you know, I saw that you grew up loving the Red Sox, and uh, thought that one day you had the dream to being a GM of the, of a uh, in Fenway. But it, it turned out you uh, found your roots in games. And how, does it, how did it even happen? How did it come up, uh, you know, born in, born in D.C., grew up uh, far from Gainesville? How, how did it come to you becoming a Gator? You know, I grew up in New Hampshire, and obviously um, I didn't know anything about Florida, but I went to graduate school at Ohio University to get a master's degree in sports administration. And to, to finish that master's degree, you had to do an internship. And it was the summer of 1976, and I left Ohio U, and I was the only guy in my class without an internship. 
So I went back mm -hmm. home to New Hampshire and I, you know, went back to my mom's house and my house and I mowed yards and I was trying to get an internship. I couldn't get one. And then in July of 76, the University of Florida called me and said they needed help in a ticket office. So it was the only opportunity I had. So I got in my car and I drove down to Gainesville, Florida. It was July. It was like 7,000 degrees in Gainesville. Yes. I've never been so hot in my life, but um, they're the only one who gave me an internship. And I got an internship in the ticket office. And then when that internship was over, I got hired to run the ticket office because the guy that was doing it left. And then I never left. I was there the rest of my life. Was, was, what an awesome story how that ended up connecting. Was there a point when, you know, when you, was it when you got hired to, to uh, run the ticket office to be like, okay, I'm a Gator. You know, this is, when, when was the point where you're like, you know, I'm, I didn't grow up around this. I don't really know too much about this. You know, I know the, the Gators are here. They chomp. It's kind of weird. It's only a college town. But when was it? ingrained in you was it was it further down the road or was it in that first year where you're like you know what I can call this place home no I, first several years I mean the job was just consuming me I didn't know anything about this I'm from a small town I went to a small college and there's this huge stadium this huge athletic program but this I get asked that question a lot and not to bring up bad memories for Gator fans but in 1980 uh, we're playing Georgia and Jacksonville football game and if we win that game we would have won the Southeastern Conference, and we had never won one in football, ever. ever. In fact, we never won one until Coach Square got here. But at that point in time, if we had won that game, we would have been SEC champions. And that's the famous Lindsey Scott game. When um, we're ahead, there's a minute left to play in the game. Georgia's got the ball on their own 10-yard line, no timeouts. And they throw a 90-yard touchdown pass to beat us. Oh my and I can remember I was devastated. I was like the rest of the Gator fans. I just I kept I, I could I couldn't sleep for like a week and I think that's when I realized how important this was to so many people and how important that was to me. Yeah. I hated losing, hated losing to Georgia of all people. And all right. so I think that's when I realized that this place had its hooks on me, you know. And um uh, unfortunately it took a loss to realize that. But you know, you know and I know you can there are lessons in losing sometime and I think I realized then that this place was really uh, in my blood because that one hurt really bad. Yeah, you know, I can I can definitely relate to uh, my my short small tenure at UF. Just feeling as though there was unfinished business. There was just an unsettling after falling short in the Elite Eight. Just like, gosh, you know, I really can see a future for myself in this game. But you know, being a, a Gator in this way, this is such a short part of my life, and. I didn't know I was going to love it. I know I was going to love it, but I didn't know I was going to love it this much. Like, do I, am I, am I ready for this chapter to end? And, and I, I felt as though I owed the university. It, it, it came with the culture. It just seemed as though, uh, not, not for me in a, in a sense of the pressure, because everyone wants to see us succeed and do the best we can. And they see the potential. They saw the potential we had. And for us to fall short year after year after year to the elite eight, which, which is still a great feat to, to accomplish that. It was like, man, there's no way I'm leaving this place before we get this Final Four. Uh, would you say, was there ever a doubt in your mind that we wouldn't make it? <laughs> you know, I mean, obviously, I have great confidence in, in Billy Donovan. I also realize it's also fragile. You know, two of those elite eights that you're talking about, and I don't, not to bring up bad memories, but, you know, we were up 11 points with eight minutes to play and two of them, you know? One of them, we just got – we faced a better team. Michigan just was better yes. than us that day. But, you know, who, who was it? Louisville and Butler or somebody. Who was it? Yes. Um, but anyway, so give them credit. I'm not taking any away from them, but you're eight minutes away from going to back-to-back -back Final Fours. And so I, as much as it hurt – obviously it hurt you. It's your life's blood. You, you, you know, you put in all the sweat, all you and your teammates and coaches and everything. I understood how – how fragile it was. But I also know that because, you know, you and, you know, Will and Casey, um, you know, Scotty, you can see guys that like each other. You can see chemistry. So, I mean, I, I you know, I certainly couldn't have said you guys going to win 30, what, 33 games in a row or whatever it was and, and make it to the final four. Who You know, if you could project that, we'd all live in Las Vegas. But you could tell right. the, fact, the fact that you all came back, um, the fact that you love the University of Florida the way you did, the way, you know, you all could have gone. 
That's what most people do. That's what selfish people, not selfish, that's what people just, they don't feel about the university the way you guys felt about it. I, I still see you guys on Twitter. I see Will tweeting, you tweeting, even now about Gators winning in tennis or Gators winning in soccer. You know, the University of Florida was in your blood. And so, you know, winners, you guys were winners, you know. So was I happy for you made the Final Four? Yeah. Could I predict that? No, because it's just so hard to do. I don't think people realize how hard it is to do. And so, right. um, but obviously for you guys, what an incredible end to your career. I know it didn't end quite the way you want it, but you know, you get the Final Four, anything can happen. You can get knocked out in that first game. You can yeah. win the last game. You can lose the last game. We've done it all at Florida. But just being there is pretty special. And I know you'll never forget it. Yeah, it was it was almost – it was so surreal to finally make it there. And uh, I was just so so thankful for Coach Donovan, how he just instilled in us to not worry about the future, to not worry about the past. It, be in the moment. It, it literally – in um, the highlights of the 06 and 07, like the videos that they always play of them winning the championships, he's been saying this, the whole thing probably his whole life, to, to stay in the moment. And we never got caught up in – uh, oh my gosh, we have a chance to win, to be undefeated in the SEC, or we have a chance to do that. We were just focused on building a brick, putting it the proper way, doing simple good, the simple thing of putting a brick down today and then putting a brick down tomorrow and then the brick down again. And before you know it, we we won. We, we didn't lose a game for like 105 days. <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> that, I don't know. That's got to be you know, a record. <laughs> you, know, you know what else you guys had? It's, and I, you're not just saying it because I'm talking to you. It's the same thing the O4 group had. And and I was watched it. Obviously, I was on trips with you. I was in locker rooms with you. I talked with Billy all the time. You know how his, his and my relationship. Incredibly unselfish. You didn't care who got points. You didn't care who was all – SEC this week or who was first team that you just wanted to win games you know and that's yes. the, the old fours are the same way you know and there's a bunch you know a bunch of first round draft picks in that team and um, they just cared about winning and that's why they won that's why you guys won you know and I don't care how many final fours you made you make back you made three consecutive elite eights you can count on one hand the number of teams in America have done that right. so you guys won you guys won in a big way but the, not only were you talented, not only did you work hard, not only did you have good coaches, you had incredible selflessness and incredible chemistry. And at the end of the day, you know, that's a formula for being successful. And a lot of teams don't get that, in my opinion. You know, if, you ha if you're selfish, it's hard to be great. And that's just the truth. And you guys were the epitome of unselfishness. That's why you won. That's why you won. You, you, you make me uh, just jump into another question for, from, from uh, your response there. Um, you know, in your tenure as AD, can you name some of your favorite, you know, and that doesn't necessarily have to be a team that uh, won a championship because obviously we didn't win a national championship, but were there some, some groups that stood out to you in, or maybe individuals, because obviously we have to look account for individual sports as well, of athletes or teams in certain years that just really stood out to you for some specific reason? Well, obviously the old fours did for obvious reasons, but here, here, here's the thing. When we hired Coach Donovan, you know, way back when, when that time period was going on, people, everybody across the country was saying it's a bad basketball job. Nobody will want that job. Florida doesn't care about basketball. All they care about is football. You know, and I, I took that stuff personally, right? You know, and, I, and that's one reason, that's one thing I sold to Billy. I said, because even Rick Pitino told him not to take our job. Really? Okay. Hell yeah. Said it was not a good job. And, you know, so there was some salesmanship there. But my point is, not knowing that team win and so unselfish like you guys, and, you know, represented us the right way. But they kind of put the exclamation point is, don't tell the Gators they can't do something. You know, because when we finally won that, you know. And so I'll always thank, you know, admire them for that. Obviously, the first, you know, the 96 football team because you know again when I first came to Florida all anybody wanted to do was win one SEC title and now you fast forward to 1996 and you're the national champions obviously we've won a couple of SEC titles I'll remember that one too 1991 first ever Southeastern Conference Championship the Gators won in football so you remember I mean you know being around guys like you and Joe Kim and Al and Danny and Tim and 
you know, Brad Wilkerson, great baseball player, you know, Caleb Dressel and, you know, Dara Torres, gold medal winners. I mean, I was blessed to be around some of the best, right? But I always looked upon as what these teams did for the University of Florida and, you know, how they represented when they won. You know, I remember when we won our first ever women's tennis championship. We had tried and tried and tried and kept falling short. And finally, we won the first one, you know. Uh, it's just it's so, it's so hard to win a championship. So all those things were special to me, Patrick. And the thing I liked about it, and again, you were part of it and you – and your teammates, but you, I'm talking to you, you in particular, the way you represented this program. You, you listened to me talk a million times. You knew how the brand was important to us. It was important to the president. It was important to the university to, to win with class, lose with class, you know, act the right way on national TV, act the right way at the podium. And we had so many people to do that. You know, we weren't a perfect program. You know that. We had people every once in a while. You had to, you know, kind of manage them. But you know, at the end of the day, I always thought that, you know, we won the right way. And that was always important to me. And that's what I remember as much as anything else. You know, one thing that I, I just truly loved about being a part of our program as well is that you never were in the, you know, the bad publicity was barely there at all. If there was any, you know, the program, our program was run, run so cleanly, um, you know, as, as far as getting in violations of this and that. Of course, there's small things because nobody can be perfect because we know that NCAA has a lot of rules for things that uh, you might not even know you're breaking sometimes. But when it came to larger things that would account for sanctions and, um, you know, was it, it was, is it difficult because there's so many things to stay on top of that? Or, or how, how, you know, I don't even know where the question is specifically, but uh, I'm sure you, you can bounce off of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, when I, when I first came to Florida, I'd go back to what I said earlier several times now, is all we wanted to do was win one SEC championship in football. And, you know, back then I'm in the ticket office, and business office. I'm just doing my job. I'm kind of, you know, you know, I had a good position, but I certainly wasn't running it. And, and in 1984, and I was 1984, you know, I'm 32 years old, we won our first, we won an SEC championship in football. And three months later, it was taken away from us because we had violated NCAA rules. And I remember when we won that game that day, we won, Gator fans will remember, older ones will remember, like me, old like me. <laughs> we um, beat Kentucky at Kentucky. We came back home. There were 60,000 people waiting for us in the stadium. Wow. You know, motorcycle escorts in from the airport. And it was an incredible feeling for the Gator Nation. And then – because of the rules violation, they took the title away from us. If you look in the NC, SEC rule book, and football champion 1984 says vacated. That was us. And I can remember back then going, what was that all about? It, we won a championship that didn't stand for anything. And so when I became athletic director, and of course, you know, it involves having a lot of people believe the same thing, we were just never going to go down that road again, you know, because it stood for nothing. I have a ring at home I can't wear because – the title was taken away. And so we talked about it a lot. I used to talk with you guys about it a lot. Talk to coaches about it. Who you hire is important. If you have a problem, you deal with it head on. You don't sit here and go, well, there's a game Saturday. We'll worry about it on Monday. No, you deal with it today. And if it costs you a player or costs you a game, so be it. Nothing is worth the integrity of the institution. So, you know, one of the things I'm very proud of in my 25 years as AD, we are never on probation. And so yes. – um, it's important. And like you said, we weren't a perfect program. We had our issues. We had things we had to deal with, you know, because um, there are no perfect places. But certainly trying to protect the reputation of the institution is really important to us and continues to be. That's what the Gators are about. Right. Well, obviously, you, you don't come across that amount of wisdom you just poured on listeners and me overnight. Um, when you were hired uh, as AD in 92, uh, uh, first off, uh, of course, you were associate, so you had a better image of what to expect and the uh, strenuous, tenuous days that you're going to to have. Uh, everything that can, you know, what what was in those first few years, or maybe your first year? What was something that really popped out of nowhere that surprised you that you had no idea would, would come your way? You know, if if you if somebody was in our offices, you know, you know, the AD's offices at the other end of the hall was my office and I was I was a senior associate athletic director at the time this is back in the early 90s and um and I prepared 
you know, I, I remember made a commitment to myself that when that job came open, I was going to try to get it again. I wanted to be a Gator. I wanted to be an AD. You have to compete. Nobody handed me anything. Nobody promised me anything. But, you know, I spent a lot of time preparing. And, and so now when I get the job, you know, I've been doing this for 16 years. I've been preparing. You know, I was a number two guy. I watched the previous AD. You know, now I move into this new office, the AD's office. And this is what you prepared your whole life for it. And what you don't realize is when now the buck stops at your desk, the final decisions are with you. The responsibility is with you. Before I was just advising you, I would recommend and, you know, whatever happened, somebody else was responsible for that. Now I was. It's just not that it was overwhelming. It's just a different feeling. You know, you, you know, a lot of sleepless nights. You got to make decisions. Right. You got to hire coaches, fire coaches, discipline, make this decision. You know, if the NCAA gets involved, it's now, you know, you're responsible. The level of responsibility when you're in the chair, anybody gets turned up a notch, right? So there are a lot of people preparing to be in that chair, you know, and when they get in the chair, they're ready to do it. It's just the thing that they will find it's totally different is now, as I said, the buck stops for you. It is, it is your, your responsibility to run the place. And it takes a little while to get used to that, you know, instead of, you know, you're kind of looking around, you know, you, know, you can't look around. Right. You, know? you got to look at, you got to look at yourself because it's, it's your, it's your show now, so to speak. And um, it took a while to get used to that. It took a while to get used right. to it. Well, I guess to break it down for uh, some listeners that, that wouldn't necessarily know what an AD does, uh, break down, you know, your, what a typical day or a typical week would look like for you. So, you know, those of us that might never be an AD, you know, maybe that's an ambition for me one day. You tell me how appealing it is, I'll, you know, I'll reconsider. Uh, but tell me, what, what is the, the daily, weekly life for you was like? You know, I get asked that question a lot, and it's the thing I liked about my job was, you know, obviously there's some routines, and I'll talk about that, but no two days were ever alike. Right. So that's why 40 years went so fast. 25 years went so fast, you know, and so – I mean, obviously, you have a responsibility for the total program. You don't run a program of this size by yourself. I was uh, incredibly blessed to have uh, a wonderful staff who, um, uh, you know, to say they uplifted me and supported me is an understatement. Um, they were my they were my crutch. They were incredibly talented. You know, Chip Howard, Mike Hill, Steve McClain, Linda Teeler, Greg McGarity. You know, you know those guys. You know those oh, my people. guy. You know, and so couldn't have survived without them. But, you know, you're running a program. You know, our budget at that time, $130, $140 million. You know, you got 500 student athletes. you got 21 sports, you know, in charge of all the coaches, obviously hiring coaches, um, you know, I, um, you know, making sure our athletes did the right thing, making sure, obviously, our student athletes got educated. Right. At the end of the day, that's what we're here for. You know, putting in place our academic center, our student life. You know, obviously, you took advantage of all that. You know, making sure the boosters are doing the right thing, making sure that our our our, our budget is balanced. So, I mean, certainly you have a ton of meetings. Obviously, you're going to games. You know, but it's also you could uh, you could wake up in the morning and go into work, and you get a phone call. One of your athletes had a problem the night before, and you spent the whole you spend the whole week dealing with that. You know, right. You're not planning that. That's not on your calendar. You know, you got to deal with um, alumni. You got to deal with board of trustees. You got to deal with uh, conference commissioners. So, it's a multifaceted job, but it, it, made, it made life interesting. I wouldn't trade my career. I wouldn't even trade my career to be GM of the of the Red Sox. You know, I may trade my career to, to play with Bruce Springsteen, but the problem is I don't play any instruments yet. You know, so. Um, but you know, I had a, like I said, I had a dream career, but it's it's it, it's a it's a big puzzle. It's a big jigsaw puzzle, and you better be paying attention to the pieces every single day. So, for a person that has to balance so many responsibilities uh what are some key components in the characteristics of somebody being a good ad you know of course you're not going to say you're perfect you know there's some but what are some some foundational things that someone that's going to be in your shoes needs to have well no particular order but um obviously you have to have the ability to surround yourself with good people you better be able to hire good people you better have good coaches uh hiring people is not a perfect formula you know I hired I was involved in hiring some really good coaches and I also 
I hired some coaches that didn't work out. It's not perfect. Um, end of the day, you're only going to be as good as the people you surround yourself with. Um, and so you got to have that ability. You got to have the ability to analyze that. And here's another thing is, and I had none of this. And I, I see what's being taught in graduate school here because I do some teaching over in the graduate school. I go back to Ohio University to teach every once in a while. I see what they're teaching there. I had to learn on the job, so to speak. If you're going to be in a leadership role, you better study leadership. Right. You better study about making decisions. You better study about holding people accountable. You better study about holding, you know, developing core values. You better study about, you know, representing, making decisions, you know, accepting responsibility. Um, yeah. You know, people ask, you know, there's an old saying out there, are leaders made or are they born? You, you know, that's, you, see, you hear that all the time. I used to think they were born. And as I, I look at my leadership journey, I think you have to have something inside you that makes you want to do it to allow you to, you know, to, to take on responsibility. But there's no question, in my opinion, leaders are, are made. You have to learn it. You have to watch. You have to study. Um, because, again, to take an organization of 500 athletes and 400 staff and take them from point A to point B, and not by myself. I want to iterate, reiterate that again. But you have to set a vision for an organization and you have to, you know, everybody's going to march in the same direction. It, that's called leadership. And, and you know, I, I was far from perfect at that, trust me. But so you have to have that ability. I think obviously you got to have some internal core values. You got to have honesty. You got to have integrity. You've got to be tough, you know, and, I, you know, isn't everybody tough? You know, I, early on in my career, I made, when I was an AD, I made some decisions and got, just crucified by the media or by the fan base. Right. I was not ready for it. I, mean, I was not ready for it at all. I didn't like it. Kind of folded like a little tent, you know, and I'm sure as an athlete, you've been through days, I'm really tough. And then one day Preston Green crushed you or you lost the game and you weren't playing as well as you thought you did or people thought you should and people are on you. And, you know, you can either wilt or you can step up and, you know, get after it, right? And my initial reaction is I wilted. And then finally one day I said, whoa, you want to be in the chair, dude. You're going to have to suck it up because um, that's part of it. That's part of it. Criticism is part of it. So you got to develop a thick skin. You got to have some broad shoulders. And again, I guarantee you as an athlete, you've been through that more than once in your life. Man, you, you, you literally just answered my next question. I was going to ask you, you know, which of these traits did you have to continue to, to work on and cultivate? And yes, that toughness is something I had to work, learn to cultivate as, as an athlete, especially in this world with social media. Um, I think a lot of times now that social media has come so prevalent in our lives, people want, we want to control. We want to control the image and what people say. But we have to realize we, we weren't made for everybody to like us in the first place. If, if me being my true self and I can express that in a way that, um, you know, for the most part is logical and I'm not doing something crazy to hurt another person in a way or extremely offensive, you know, there's no one's going to like everything you do. Uh, but as long as you can trust, you can have, like you said, have the right people around you um, because no matter what, you make a bad decision. Guess what? You're the, a the AD. You're basketball. You got to show up the next day. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, if you made a mistake, fix it. <laughs> You know, that's the thing about it. It's called accountability. And when you make a mistake, a lot of people in leadership roles don't want to raise their hand. And I always think it's human because everybody makes mistakes, right? If you make too many, obviously you're not going to be successful. Obviously, if you make too many on a basketball court, you may not be starting, okay? That's the way of the world, you know? But I think have, making, uh, you know, if you're accountable for your own mistakes, it's how you get better, you know? If you're sitting there and you're blaming somebody else, or making excuses, how could you ever get better? You know, right. and obviously I made a million mistakes and you just, you have to be able to self-evaluate. The best coaches and the best athletes around here, when they failed, all they do is look in the mirror and they figure out a way to get better and go back to work. And here's the thing people don't realize about criticism and not letting it impact you. You knew when you weren't playing well. I knew when I made mistakes. And so if I'm reading stuff, or pe I don't need to read. I knew it. I knew that I, did, I failed. I, I hired a coach who didn't work out. I don't need to read the paper and read the internet and read social media. I need to right. fix it. You know, if I read that, it's taking, away, taking me away from the job at hand, right? And I get it's human nature to want to read that stuff and get mad at that stuff. It's also counterproductive. 
If you, yeah. Patrick Young, are not playing well, okay, and you are hurting your team, and you spend all your time on Twitter reading what people are saying about you, all it's going to do is make you feel worse. And it's also taking you away from getting yourself back in the freaking gym and figure right. out why you're not playing well, right? Too many people get distracted by that stuff, right? That's why I'm not on, I never was on social media for that reason, all right? Good I realize the world has changed, and as, as an athletic director, as an organization, we have to pay attention to it. We have to be on it. We have to communicate that way. But if somebody on Twitter was ripping Jeremy, I to this day don't know about it, right? Because that just took me away from my job. All right. Yes. The job's hard enough without reading stuff that doesn't impact your ability to change yourself. What, what, what sense does it make, you know, if you're having, for instance, uh, girlfriend or marital issues, why would I, instead of addressing it with maybe a counselor or someone that, why would I go to some random Joe off the street that only saw a, a picture, a page in it, and is going to give their two cents and allow that to be what, you know, the, something that affects my decision making going forward when I know I have, like you said, people around you, if you feel as though you need some help, uh, the buck stops there, but you have a, a, a people around you say, hey, let me bounce this off you or et cetera, or, you know, how can we do better in this way? I thought this was going to go this way, but, it did, you know, having the right people, it, it, being intentional with who you allow, it, it took me a long time to learn that message of, uh, who are the voices that I'm allowing into my life? Are they trying to build me up or is there some hidden incentive? Uh, or do they actually know me? Do they actually care about me? And, or are they just pointing the finger at me and, and just because they wish they were in my position, but they're not, you know, I'm very grateful for where I am, but are they just being a spectator that's just stirring things up? And sometimes that's what people do. They just want to get in your head. They want to get you off your game. Yep. Especially, especially Georgia fans, but we, you know, <laughs> hopefully, hopefully they'll, they'll skip over that part. But uh, um, I wanted to uh, jump into something else that just really, really, really made me so thankful. Something that you said in, in one of your, um, your articles that I was reading up before I got a chance to do this. Um, when doing some reading, like I said, you talked about a time where people ask you about being lead commissioner and you know, any Gator fan will actually say, yeah, of course, we could see him doing that. Uh, but we don't want to see you leave. And you, you, you made the, the, the statement that you have great respect for the job, but it's too impossible to be a fan for 14 different teams because you're so much of a fan of the Gators. And I was just like, man, I love that. I'm so grateful that I got to play for an AD uh, that hired a coach that just loves Gator, everything Gator because I grew up a Gator. My, my grandparents were diehard Gator fans. They were season ticket holders uh, for a while. And I was so angry at them when they sold their season tickets. <laughs> <laughs> they had gotten grandfathered in and they were still only paying like $1,200. And I'm like, Grandma, I like, why, you didn't even ask me. <laughs> you think I didn't? <laughs> like, I, I would have taken those tickets and for the rest of my life, but you know, what, what is it about being a Gator that just makes you, made you just feel so settled in where you are, like the, the vision you had for the program? I just, um, this is a special institution, I'm telling you, you don't know. It's just, um, you know, from day one, just being around the people of this place and not just around athletes and coaches, just people on campus, students, people who graduate from here. The fact they love this place so much and how important the Gators were to them and, you know, I worked for five different presidents and every single one of them was trying to take the Gators to the next level. Nobody was ever satisfied with just being okay. They wanted to be great. And, you know, being great doesn't happen overnight and building it has to be built the right way. And I would watch that. And, you know, it was also an institution that was about doing the right things. Um, it's just, and then obviously incredible passion by our fan base. I mean, I mean, I watched it. I mean, the, tickets they bought the number of people came to our games how important it was and you know passion cuts both ways when you're not winning you hear about it but right. that's okay it's important to them and if it's important to them it needs to be important to us and i just like being part of that and obviously we were part of so many special things here you know final fours and football playoffs and you know omaha baseball Oklahoma city softball tennis golf swimming i mean you know, right you know track you go right down the list and volleyball soccer and actually you know just part of something special. So I just, it was an incredible vibe around here. 
way back when, you know, they don't, obviously it's changed and certainly COVID's changed it, but homecoming around here and Gator Growl, you see the spirit on campus and Gator Growl was produced by students. And, I mean, just incredible. And it was just so, it gets, it, it gets in your blood, you know, obviously I wasn't, didn't go to school here, but you cut me open now, you know what I'm bleeding. And um, right. it gets in your blood. And, um, uh, you know, obviously to be part of this place and to be a Gator, I mean, obviously I'll be a Gator to, for the rest of my life. Right. Just, you know, just incredible blessing, as I said early on. Well, I, I can't tell you, um, I, I was on Twitter before our, our, our show here and asked the fans, you know, last second request, if anyone wants to ask something specific for, for Jeremy Foley and, uh, everyone was just wanting to tell you how thankful they are for everything that you did for the university. Uh, I'm sure you've, that's been expressed to you in a multitude of ways, but I think it's always great to tell someone, thank you for living in purpose and uh, for a common goal, uh, especially my man, Jerome Millman, yeah, uh, yeah. super gator. He, 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 uh, he wanted to tell guy. you, thank you for everything. Yeah. That's my guy. Yeah. Talk about, a, talk about someone that inspires me just to, just to keep going, that I that I made the right decision to, to be a game. Every day, you know, he always takes time to come visit me here in my office, you know, and um, just incredible spirit. Always, it's amazing the attitude he has in the game of life. And uh, like you say, he inspires me. Every time he visits me, um, I walk out, you know, he walks out and makes me want to be a better person. Right. He, you know? he was one of the first people that I was like, I'm giving him a jersey. You know, I, I don't I don't know him. I didn't know him before I became a Gator. But just his 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 passion for life, his faith, um, the way he interacts with people, his consistency—it uh, just makes you. He's like this guy is special to me, and I'm thankful for him, and I want to do something for him. I got I got a chance to go to his house. His house is decked out in Gator stuff. It's pretty awesome. He keeps inviting me. We haven't made that work yet, but I want to see. His oh house. man, I want to see his house. If you get if you get a chance, you 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 will love it. So uh, let's do a little bit of a transition here. Um, in order to win and to win at the level you have in your tenure, obviously there is a huge competitive drive, but you have a huge competitive nature. You don't win by just association or by luck. Um, you know, as an athlete, for me, it, it was very easily to, uh, to become complacent, um, to allow human nature to set in and be like, you know, I made it or I did this and I achieved this, pat myself on the back. Um, as an AD, you had the vision for UF that was rooted in your competitive drive. Was it hard to maintain that drive, you know, after winning this and winning that and, or, you know, obviously I can see you had the ambition for UF because um, you kept pushing for things financially to get better. Like that, and I gotta let you know, I'm a little upset about the Hawkins Center um, because you, you did that when I left. <laughs> <laughs> the Hawkins Center is awesome. Yeah. That's, you know, so much changed after we left. I'm like, come on, we stayed all four years. I didn't get to go on a pre one of these beginning of the season uh, tournaments to Atlantis or Hawaii, uh, the Hawking Center. The rules off the shape. chain. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, yeah, how, was it difficult to maintain that competitive drive each year? You know, first of all, having grown up in this program, so to speak, professionally, this is, as I told you earlier, this is a great place, but this, this place has a lot of things going for it. Incredible academics, as you know, incredible fan base. We live in Florida, you know, recruiting base in Florida is incredible. Um, but because of our boosters and our season ticket holders, incredible financial support, you know, so if we're not being really good in everything, we're, we're, that's on us. And, you know, I didn't get in this business and none of us here got in this business any more than you did to be mediocre. Right. You know, you want to take, you know, you're not winning everything every year. It doesn't work that way. But you know, if you're at the University of Florida, the bar should, it should be set pretty high and we set it pretty high. You know, and obviously in a lot of sports, we cleared that bar. And, um, but once you clear it, you know, the thing that used to motivate us is falling back. And, you know, it used to scare me to death. So keeping at the edge was something I focused on. I, I hated mediocrity. I mean, I hated the thought of being complacent. I think that happens a lot in sports. Absolutely. And when you get complacent, you know, sometimes you don't even realize you're being complacent until it's too late. And so we talked about it, you know. We liked being successful. We liked 
you know, people talking about the Gators. We liked winning that all sports trophy in the SEC because it's a tough league. You know, we never talked about it, but we, you know, it became important to our staff and to our athletes. We put those T-shirts in our lockers. We wanted our athletes to take pride in it, you know. And when there was slippage, if there was in a certain sport, it was my job as athletic director to um, hold people accountable to that. Yes. Um, and athletics, as you know, they don't care about the last game. They don't care about what you did the year before. They care about right now. And so you have to keep an edge, especially at a place like Florida, because of all the uh, resources that we have and all the things we have going for us. If you don't work on that, you could fall back. So we worked hard not to get complacent. And I don't, And then eventually that becomes part of your culture. You know, yes. you know it becomes part of who you are. And that's kind of that's how we handled it. And it wasn't just me. You have coaches believing in that. You played for Billy Donovan. Right. Billy Donovan, he, he didn't like losing at all. You know, he had a fear of failure. So did I. And so um, if you fear failing, you usually don't get complacent. Speaking of coaches, um, what, is your, what was your philosophy um, with your, your hiring process? Because um, obviously you have a great record of great coaches all across but you don't get there by every single one being a success. You know what? How did that start for you in 92 and evolve for you throughout 2016 of your hiring process? Well, you know, the first big hire I had as athletic director was Billy Donovan. And it was kind of a planned deal, not necessarily him. And certainly there's no way I had a crystal ball that he was going to do what he did. Okay. But all I know is I just told you, nobody, nobody thought we could do it in basketball. Everybody thought this was a bad job. I had been in Florida for 16 years at the time, and we kept hiring kind of the same mold. And they weren't bad people. And obviously, Lon Kruger did a great job for us, took us to a Final Four. But two years later, he was gone. Two years later, we won 12 games. And so it's just, you know, to be great in athletics in this country, you have to be good in men's basketball. The NCAA tournament brings you too much notoriety, too much attention, and you have to be in it. And I was sitting there going, we can't be one of 64 teams every year. I mean, just get in it. And then who knows right. what can happen, okay? And so we did something different, decided to hire a young up-and-comer, hired Billy, and, you know, obviously the rest is history. But because Billy was so successful, I kind of thought I had it all figured out. And I hired Billy by myself. I went to visit Billy. You know, Greg McGarity went with me, but I kind of did it lone wolf. And so now I figured I had it all figured out. So I did all these hires, lone wolf, and we kept hiring some okay people, but not great people. And, you know, it all changed when I got other people in the room, people I trusted, Linda and Mike and Chip and Greg and Stevie Mack and Mary Howard. When we all got in a room and we all talked about it and we all weighed in, we started hiring some really good coaches. And so, for me, it became a collective effort. Obviously, we're looking for people we thought could win. Obviously, we're looking for people who are going to follow the rules. We wanted people who appreciated all sports. You know how it is around Florida. All 21 sports are important to us. Absolutely. We get, we get football and basketball is important. It needs to win financial, you know, consequences when they don't. But, you know, women's lacrosse, women's tennis, soccer, golf, you go right down the list. They're all important to us. We wanted coaches who bought into that because on a college campus, it's just not football and basketball. It's an intercollegiate athletic program. So you're trying to pe fit, find people that could fit into that mold as well. And we weren't afraid to take a chance in the up and comer. You know, we want to change, you know, because a lot of good coaches, every time we had an opening here, everybody thought, well, everybody, they all want to come to Florida. It's a great job. What well, is a great job? But it's not the only great job in the country. Right. People, really good coaches stay where they're at, you know, they like where they're at. They like their bosses. They like their culture. They like the money they're getting paid. They like their team. Their family likes where they live. And so it's not, so finding coaches, really good ones automatically want to move is not that easy. So we kind of had a philosophy. Let's find the next great one. Let's find the next great one. Okay. Let's find Billy. Let's find Kevin O'Sullivan. Let's find Tim Walton. Let's find, you know, Rhonda Fain, you know, let's find them. And, Again, Moose. What's that? Moose. Yeah, yes. You know, and so you find those, and if they work out, then you have them for, for a long, long time because they know you invested in them early on in their career and you supported them. So, again, not a perfect science. 
Um, but, you know, once we got more people in the room, a lot of good things happen to us. I've got a chance to um, hear Coach White talk about – Mike White talk about his hiring process from his perspective. Um, can you tell us about – you know what, I love Coach White. I think Coach White's special. Um, I love him as a man. I love him as a coach. Um, I think he's our guy. I got a chance to interview him a few weeks ago and talk about his statistics – lined up next to Billy in the first five years. And they are, uh, he's got a little bit of a better SEC record. Uh, um, but from the looks of it, it looks very, very close to the same. And I really think this year, Coach White's going to have a special squad. Uh, if I think he finally has the core group of guys and he's going to get back to the identity of what he had in Louisiana Tech of that run and gun, pressing majority of the game. What was it about Coach White that made him stand out uh, from the other? And if, if you can, uh, who were the other coaches you considered at that at that time before his hiring? Well, we really honed in on Mike early on. A couple of things that you knew Billy, and you know how Billy did his business, how he lived his life. And I can remember the first time I talked to Mike, I said, Mike, obviously I want to replace the wins and the championships. I said, I, wa I want that to happen. I would like that to happen. I said, but I am going to try. I am going to replace the person because Billy treated people well. You know, Billy, the environment in the building down there was healthy with Duke and Tracy and Preston. And, you know, people worked together. Billy treated everybody in the building the right way. Everybody in the UA the right way, right? You know, it was very important to replace that part of it, right? Because Billy did that for 19 years, okay? And obviously, I want to replace the wins. And you just look at Mike's background. You no, know, Mike, you know, Mike has done a great job for us. You know, and I think some of the comparisons to Billy are unfair, but that's, that's an itch. And Mike has never shied away from replacing Billy Donovan, you know. He hopped at the opportunity because he knew what a great program it was and what Billy built. But I like the fact that Mike played in this league. I like the fact he coached in this league. I like the fact he recruited in the South. I like the fact that he took over a really tough job at Louisiana Tech and won and won. You know, the criticism when we hired him, well, he'd never been in the NCAA tournament, you know. That's true. He played in a league where if you didn't win your conference tournament, you didn't go. That's right. an incredible amount of pressure, okay? But the person, you know, you talk to people around the country, and, you know, you've been around Mike, and, you know, just the type of person he is, the individual he is, and I, obviously I'm prejudiced. I think he's a big-time coach. It doesn't happen overnight, and, you know, it's hard. You know, bottom line is he's in the Elite Eight. Um, how many years ago that was now? But we're tied with South Carolina. It was 40 seconds ago. That game could have gone either way. And right. you're in the final four. He didn't credit South Carolina, but that's how hard it is, you know. But the same token here, here's this. She also has to hit a shot the night before to get there. It doesn't go in. I mean, that's the game you play in basketball, right? Mike is um, steady Eddie. He's about all the right things. And the first time we met him, it was pretty obvious, you know. We poked around the edges of other coaches. Their name's Patrick. I'd rather not talk about because they're not relevant. But we honed in on him and – um I just think by the end of the day, when it's all said and done for him, people stay strong behind him. He's got a really good staff. Um, the dude the dude knows what he's doing. Plus, yeah. he's a hell of a guy. And so um, I just think it was, uh, it was a perfect fit for the University of Florida because the people down in that building love him the way they love Billy because the way he treats them. Yeah. And, again, that's important. That's very – the vibe in the building was very important to me. I mean, just – the transition, you know, at, at first when Coach Donovan announced that he was leaving, the Coach White came in, you know, initially I'm like, oh, man, it's not going to be the same. Uh, you know, am I going to go back to Gainesville as much? And I'm thinking all these these thoughts in this direction. I got to tell you, I, I, I thoroughly enjoy any opportunity I get to come down uh, to Gainesville. Uh, want to shout out and thank all the people in the UAA. Uh, first off, uh, Coach White and his staff. Duke Warner, um, I can't wait to have him on the show. I'm sure he's got a bunch of fantastic yeah, stories. Yeah, Duke, think of stories he can tell. Might need to be like a, a full day podcast. I'm sure he's got plenty. <laughs> um, Preston Green, uh, Tracy and Jack Path, uh, love them to death. Uh, Alicia Longwood, um, I got, I got, I, I didn't want to forget anybody because I'm just so thankful for everyone uh, along the way. Jamie McClowski. Kim Green, Daniel Siegel, uh, Alicia Longworth, um, Kelly Bradley, uh, um, Valerie Flournoy, Allison Forrest, Tony Meacham, 
uh, Chris Smith, Caleb Storges, Tom Williams. Big shout out to Tom Williams. Fantastic man. Um, Jason Storch. I'm so thankful for everyone at the UAA. Um, and just coming back to Gainesville is home for me. Uh, especially when I get a chance to, to run into you <laughs> and Denver Parlor. Don't want, don't want to forget Denver. He helped me get, get back in contact with you. But uh, got a few more questions for you. I know you probably got a busy day. Um, but the next one I want to ask you, can you name some of your favorite, probably already asked you this, but do you have any more of your favorite, favorite uh, Gator moments? Maybe they could be unsports related. Who knows? Well, you know, um... It's sports related, but it's it's not related to um, games. And it kind of goes back to the decision you made to come back. You know, after we won back-to-back -back national championships, you know, Al Horford and Joe Kim Noah and Corey Brewer and Torrin, they had to go out. They couldn't come back again. You know what I'm saying? Too much money involved. You know, they'd won back-to-backs. You know, but I'll never forget their press conference. It was like a funeral. They were not excited to leave the University of Florida. And they weren't excited about leaving Coach Donovan. Kind of the things you've talked about, you know, and the family atmosphere here and the way people all work together and everything. I'll never forget that because that's so rare today. I mean, obviously those guys have gone on and done well and gone on to make, you know, all kinds of money. But on that day, it was about they were leaving the family and it was hard on them. I mean, I'm talking about tears. And wow. you would think that the joy – and I'll never forget, I thought it said so much about not only Billy and his group, but just the University of Florida. They love being Gators. You guys love being Gators. You know, that's why you like coming back. That's why Will loves coming back. It's, you know, maybe it's that way every place. I don't know. It's the only place ever worked is here, okay? So, you know, I'll, I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget this moment either. And, and um, um, the football team won the national championship in 2006 and the basketball team had won the year before right so we come back that night from arizona and we land whatever time it was and we're playing arkansas in basketball so a lot of us drove over we I mean, got off the airplane we went right over to um the gator game against arkansas and it was joe kim noah and alan horford they're back it's their you know it's their second year it's their they're going for the second championship and when the football team walked in, because we brought them in to introduce them to the crowd, the basketball team went crazy. Joe Kim Noah and Al Horford went over and kind of like dove on them. Corey Brewer, <laughs> Corey. They were so excited. And again, it says a lot about Florida. There's a lot of places, well, we want ours, and you now you've got yours, and maybe a little jealousy or whatever have you. You should have seen how excited the looks. The minute they saw them, again, I think it says a lot about Florida, the way people – you know, pull together. I've seen you and I've seen you and your 13 team being at soccer matches that meant so much to the university. I've seen you at tennis matches, you know, the little stuff like that people don't see, you know, uh, it, when Steve Spurrier got here, you know, obviously here's Steve, you know, national championship coach and SEC championship coach, I didn't trophy winner, you know, his office is next to mine. And I saw his team one day going out to practice because we have to walk across the street there outside my office. And I saw them all walk out, and like 30 minutes, we had a big game on Saturday. I forget who it was, but I, about 40 minutes later, I saw him walking back, and I, I heard Steve walk up into his office because he was right next to me, and I went, is everything okay? I said, why is practice over? He goes, women's tennis team is playing Georgia today for the SEC title down at tennis. We're all going down to watch, right? Name another football program in America where that happens. Right. Okay? So, I just remember stuff like that because I think it says a lot about Gator Nation. It doesn't, like I said, it doesn't make us better than other places. Maybe it makes us a little different. But I just think that um, when stuff like that happens and there's no jealousies and there's, everybody's pulling the same direction, a lot of good things can happen for the program. I got to tell you, um, there was just something special about being in that environment with other athletes, you know, getting a chance is to learn about softball girls and they were telling me um, how there was a, a stigma that the SEC would never win a, a national championship, uh, that they would never get over the hump or watching the women's lacrosse team doing their thing, winning the conference, uh, going to the soccer. It was, it was just something of being connected and sharing that goal that we're all representing the, the Gators. We're all doing this together. 
and getting a chance to learn these stories from people that are from all over the nation. Gator Nation is everywhere, all over the, the country that are just doing the best they can and being able to, to learn about them and cheer for them. Uh, it was so special for Will and I. We, we went to so many so many events and I really miss because I, I don't know the last time I've been to a soccer game. I don't know the last time I've been able to go to a baseball game or a, a lacrosse game. Uh, but those are memories, things that I won't ever forget. You know, I, I found such a great love for lacrosse. What a great sport. There's <laughs> those girls are so good. <laughs> they were, oh, they were pretty problem. awesome. I'm proud. All right, uh, the thing is, the thing is, you got to realize is that if you, this sounds arrogant, but I'm trying not to be, but it's the truth. If you're playing at the University of Florida, it means you're pretty talented, which means you could have played anywhere in the country. And if you're here, people need to pay attention to you, whether, you, whether you're a football player, a basketball player, or a lacrosse player, soccer player. I think the fact that our, our coaches, our staff, and people like yourself and your teammates and Coach Brewer and his team, pay I think that makes people want to come to a place like this. It's just a healthy environment, you know? And that's the way it should be. It's a college athletic program. And um, absolutely, that's what I thought was always special about this place. Fantastic. I got I got one more quote for you here. I, I wonder if you'll be able to uh, name the song. I think this is a more popular one. I got something in my heart. I've been waiting. Ooh, I can't read my own handwriting. Oh, got it. Here we go. I got something in my heart. I've been waiting to give. I got a life I want to start. One I've been waiting to live. Gosh. I need to really work on my handwriting. This looks like chicken scratch. Let me try that one more time. I got something in my heart I've been waiting to give. I've got a life I want to start, one I've been wanting to live. Is that the boss again? It's, oh, of course. I love it. I did my research. Hey, yeah, did. Leah? Leah? What's that? You know that one? Leah. I don't know that song. Oh man, I put. I, <laughs> I'm gonna look it up. I'm Preston, gonna look it up now. Preston Green is gonna be very disappointed. He's a, he's a huge Springsteen guy as well. But I like that quote because it doesn't. It's not entirely accurate for you because you obviously you did a lot of great things um, these past few years of your of your life. Uh, I'm just thinking you know, what I think you told me. Um, when you when you you step down, that you're going to go to Vermont and start just to relax there. Was that the is that the correct place that you said you were going to go? Yeah, I have a home in Vermont. I've had it. You know, I grew up in New Hampshire, so New England's in my blood. So I've been up there more than I was when I was athletic director. But you know, I miss Gainesville. I've been back here now for a couple of weeks, and it's great to be back around the university. I, I teach a few classes and you know, help Scott where he needs help. But um, follow the Gators and. You know, pay attention to what's going on here. But obviously, um, my life's a little different now. But, yeah, I've been in Vermont uh, here for the last four months. What uh, I meant to ask you this, hopefully we'll be able to, to cut this one in. Um, speaking on the, you know, more for, for the business side of people that um, would pick your brain in this aspect. Um, here we go. Each year financially, you posted a balanced budget. You know, how did, for one, how did you maintain this balance in a way that you continue to be ambitious in a way that you wanted, because you have to factor in, you want the program to be innovative and uh, have the best uh, things for the athletes and for recruiting purposes, for the coaching, for, to cultivate everything you need for the, 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 the to win. Um, you know, how did you maintain that ambition, but also stay in a in a way of, of safety because i was talking to denver you know university of florida in this pandemic has been in a fairly good condition fairly good shape compared to other universities and a lot of that most of that <laughs> uh is, is because of your doing you know how did you uh put the university in the position you know, obviously you weren't preparing for a pandemic um, but you know that was coming but you did a, a great job to for the, the the budget to be pandemic proof well, I'll go back to what I said earlier. We're blessed to have an incredible fan base. They um, support us. They buy season tickets. They help us build buildings. You know, but you know, I think as I've said a number of times here, we had 21 sports, and they are all important to us. And you got to fund them. Um, you know, we we paid attention to facilities. There's there's some fans who thought we should have paid more attention to facilities, and I respect that opinion. At the end of the day, I don't think that was the end all be all. I think having great academics. I think having great coaches and 
having, you know, you know, I think that was the difference. Um, but I, you know, I was conservative by nature. We all were. Um, but you can't be all things to all people. Obviously, you got to provide football with the resources because they're generating the resources. And right. um, but by the same token, when you have a, a Billy Donovan down here and you have a, a um, Becky Burley or a Mike White or you know right down the list, Miles My, Holloway or Kevin O'Sullivan, you know you got to you got to pay attention to them too. But you can't pay attention to everybody all at once because the money isn't there. Or you can borrow a bunch of money and go into debt. And if you're in debt, and comments you just made about during the pandemic you know, put you in a difficult position. So, right. you know, I just think being frugal, taking advantage of the, of the blessings we had to have an incredible fan base, you know, you know, being intentional in terms of this year, we're going to work on this project, you know, the academic center next year, we're going to work on this project because you can't do it all once. And I never believed in building, you know, the fanciest buildings because at the end of the day, you want to win in this business, you better have some really good coaches. You have to go get some really good athletes and develop them. Yes, you have to have facilities, and we believe in that, and we have some really nice ones here, and Scott's making them even better. But, um, you know, we won by, you know, I guess paying attention to our programs and also being frugal. You, you, you know, you, the dollars in this business get harder and harder to come by, and so you have to have to pay attention to them. And like I said, I'm conservative by nature, and that's, that's what we did. Man, awesome. Um I have one one more question and a quick story I wanted to share with you. Uh, my really good buddy, uh, we went, ended up going to high school together. He uh, posted this question on Twitter. What is the root or the, um, yeah, what's the root for the story of you giving student athletes big red gum uh, at basketball games, at home games? <laughs> you know, uh, what a great question. I think I did it one game just to be friendly. And, or, or somebody said, hey, Mr. Foley, give me a piece of gum. I turned around and gave him a piece of gum. And we won the game. Well, I'm, I'm very superstitious. I'm very <laughs> superstitious, right? And, you know, you know, superstitions, I mean, they may not work every day, but if they're working, you know, more often than not, I'm going to keep it going. So I started doing it uh, every game after that. And, you know, when we played in the Connell, Connell Center, we won more often than not. And so um, – it was a right. superstition. Jack Path had to walk across the floor, or Matt McCall used to walk across the floor. They would give me the gum, and I would turn around and give it to the students. That was a superstition. That's how that started, and I did that for a lot of years in my career, just as a superstition. Are there any any more uh, ones like that, or is that the most uh, <laughs> most uh, the one you've held on to for the longest? You know. Um, you know, a Buckeye, you ever heard of a Buckeye? It's from Ohio. They're supposed to be, if you have a Buckeye, it's supposed to be a good luck piece. And somebody gave me a Buckeye, and the year we won the national championship in basketball the first time, for some reason, I, that Buckeye, I saw it on my counter in my house, and I put it in my pocket before the NCAA tournament started, and we won. And so I carried that Buckeye with me for, I can't, I threw the football to the next basketball, uh, you know, and um, before the before the the basketball, the second one we won, I couldn't find it. This true story, I couldn't find it because oh, I man. just I just moved homes, and I'd sold the home I left. I'd moved in my new home, and I went back to my old home because I had a cleaners come through because the people who bought it were coming into my house, and I'd lost the buck. I said, okay, you lost it in the move. And we're getting ready to play in the NCAA tournament. I'm in the jar. I walked in my garage for the last time, and sitting in the middle of an empty garage is that Buckeye. And I picked that some buck up, and damn it, we don't win the national championship again. That's a true story. That's a true story. That's awesome. I'm taking credit. Awesome. My Buckeye won the national championship. <laughs> well, they, the, the, the actual Buckeyes were not very happy with the Gators in 2006. We know no, that one no. for sure. They weren't happy for us for a couple <laughs> for a couple of years there. Well, I, I want to share with, uh, with you one last story of how I knew I was supposed to be a Gator. Um, I want to say, like I said earlier, my grandparents were diehard and still are to this day, fortunate to still have them with us. They were, they came to almost every home game, which was another big decision to me coming to, uh, make, which made it so easy for me to come to Florida because they live in uh, Jacksonville and they love to drive. But 
they had they have a their big RV traveling RV family, and they would always uh, tailgate. And um, I want to say the old Gale Limeran parking lot. It's it's kind yeah. of by where the um, the parking area is now, where where you have to pay for tickets. It, I, I think it used to be over there. We came. Uh, I think I was 11, 10, 11, 12 years old. And uh, I had come, come to Gainesville for a few games before I love tailgating. I love uh, just being in the RV and, and everyone had their kids there. It's just a great time. And we were playing against Vandy. Uh, we were behind the south end zone. Then the net wasn't up. And I'm just sitting there. We just scored a touch. And I'm like, please let me catch. I want to catch this PAT so bad, so badly. And it, it kicked it, went up, deflected. Deflected, deflected, landed right in my hands. Football. I was like, I don't know what. I've peaked. I was like, I've peaked in life right now. I, <laughs> Lord, you can take me right now. <laughs> and I, I, I threw it back, and and that just ingrained in me such a, a deep, deep love for the Gators, and I knew it was a, a place I was going to call home. Uh, we're, we're, and I'm my sister down here. You know how I feel about you, man. I've always felt this way about you, but. We're blessed that you're a Gator because you represent everything we wanted in the whole program. You know, you, you treated people right. You always had a smile. You appreciated what you got here. You appreciated your coaching. But all those people you just read off, you know, those are academic people who, if people don't know them, those are, those are marketing people. Those are communications people. And, you you know, strength people, trainers. You always, you always appreciated what people gave you. And, um I think your teammates were that way too. And I go back to what we talked about earlier in the show. You were selfless, you know, you were not a selfish person. And, you know, plus the way you love the University of Florida Gators always been special to all of us, you know. And I remember I saw you, I don't know when you were at a basketball game in the new arena. I hadn't seen you forever. And, you know, you you could have been nicer to me. I think you gave me a big hug. And, you know, it's just, you know, it just, that's the way you are, Patrick. So we're blessed you're a Gator, man. I, I, I can't tell you. Yeah, I'm so I'm so thankful, especially when I left when I left UF and, and became a professional. Was where I was like, wow, I was living in uh, the greatest place <laughs> in the world yeah. for for four years, yeah. and now everything costs money, and everyone's not as nice. And <laughs> but uh, I'm so thankful. And the last thing I wanted to tell you is a happy early birthday. I know we're we're pretty close. Today is today is November seventeenth, but this is going to air a little bit later than that. Your birthday might actually come be uh, on the day this comes out, but I just wanted to wish you that. I'm so thankful for Thank this you. time. Um, this is going to bless a lot of people. It blessed me. I could literally talk to you all day, uh, but I know you have a lot going on today. Uh, we, but anyways, we'll do it, we'll do it again so one day. We'll do it mm-hmm. again one day. That sounds and like a plan. Enjoy, you know, it's so good to see you, man. Good luck. Take care of yourself. Hurry back home, okay? Thank you. All right. Catch you later. Take care, bud. Good to see you back. Bye-bye.